<coughs> Thank you for uh, being here early to attend uh, this grand round. Uh, I'm going to talk about minimally invasive surgery in gastrointestinal cancer management. Uh, here at KHC, what we, are, what we have done over the last year, uh, I've been here only for almost one year. Actually, I finished my first year here. Uh, we've done so many new things, and I, I'd like to share with you some of our achievements over the last year. This subject is dear to my heart. I strongly believe in this approach for cancer. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, skepticism about uh, whether it's applicable or not, but over the last many years, or at least 20 years, there were so many uh, uh, prospective randomized trials confirming its safety and applicability in, in cancer patients. Uh, if you go about uh, the term of minimally invasive procedure or surgery, it's uh, any procedure that is less invasive than uh, the open surgery used for the same purpose. So basically you try to uh, use long instruments uh, with the monitor uh, and you achieve the same purpose of the open surgery by less tissue destruction and in a minimally invasive way. Basically patients end up with small incisions which is much better than the big incisions that open surgery usually use that has a lot of complications. Uh, minimal invasive surgery has so many applications in a lot of surgery disciplines in terms of, you know, any abdominal operations now can be done laparoscopically, uh, OBGYN, urology, GI, uh, as well as uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, and uh, thoracoscopic sur uh, uh, thoracic surgeons also can, can do minimally invasive procedures. Uh, Dr. Ahab Massad is here, and he's done a lot of work on minimally invasive lung cancer resections. And uh, the scope of my lecture is going to concentrate on gastrointestinal cancer, where I do specialize. The term minimally invasive was introduced by John Wickham. He's a urologist from London back in 1987. In his editorial, he used the term the new surgery, and he introduced the term of minimally invasive surgery at that time. He went over what's been done at that time. Laparoscopic appendectomies was new. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy was new. And he, he kind of established the first uh, minimally invasive departments in, in the world uh, uh, at that time. Uh, he uh, made a very nice uh, statement here where the history of surgery now is divided into three phases. This is back in 1987. From ancient times till the mid-19th centuries, surgery was rough, rabid, brutal, ablative, and had only limited applications. I think some of you still believe that we are that bad. Anyway. In the second phase, which has lasted until 1960, anesthesia and improved resuscitation techniques allowed complicated procedures to be carried only minimal thoughts being given to the effect on the patient. Many deaths and much illnesses were caused by the activities of the surgeon rather than the disease itself. And since 1960s, some surgeons have realized that operation could be performed more elegantly and less traumatically with advanced uh, instruments, particularly endoscopes. At that time, he made some expectations over the next 30 years what, what he believed surgery will be, and he said open surgery at that time will be an obsolete. There will be no more open surgeries 30 years later. I don't think his statement or his expectation held true right now. I think open surgery still have a very strong applications in many cases, but I think minimal invasive surgery had come along very well over the last 30 years and had a wide, wide applications overall. Back in 1920, Lord Monaghan, a great British surgeon, in his book, The Ritual of Surgical Operation, stated that, this is a very, very important statement, the cleaner and gentler the act of operation, the less pain the patient suffers, the smoother and quicker the convalescence, the more the exquisite his healed wound, the happier his memory of the whole incident. So back in 1920, he, he realized, this surgeon, that if you do less tissue damage, you end up with a happier patient. He, 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 before all the basic science research that was done about the trauma of operation, the st stress response to injury, before all these things, he realized that, you know, a, you know, a less tissue damage results in a better quality of life. If we're going to say a happy patient had a better quality of life. Before the global assessment of health quality and before everything else, he realized back in 1920. First laparoscopic appendectomy was done in 1980, uh, and the Germans had led the, that led the way overall uh, in terms of uh, laparoscopic surgery. Uh, and both of them were ob uh, ob uh, ob uh, gynecologists, Sam and Mohi, back in the 80s, you know, led the way of laparoscopic appendectomies and laparoscopic cholecystectomies. Over the 90s, there was an explosion of this approach for mainly benign disease. 
There are so many case series, so many uh, 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 prospective studies were done showing that laparoscopy in benign disease is safe. There is significant decrease in the perioperative morbidity. There is decrease in the length of hospital stay. That's some, something that people look into you know, seriously in, in, in the West. Associated with less pain, resulting in a better quality of life and better cosmotic results and that some patients look for. So laparoscopy become even the standard of care for most benign diseases right now in terms of diagnostic laparoscopy, cholecystectomies, some hernias, gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomies, uh, reflex disease, achalasia, splenectomy. But, you know, you know it's something to, to notice that most of these, you know, become a standard of care without the presence of prospective randomized trials. So basically there are so many case series and so many, a large number of case series that showing it's, been, it's, it's good, it's better than open surgery, and people start adopting it. Nobody asks for, for prospective randomized trials because of the benign nature of the disease. If you can provide the same procedure for a benign disease in a laparoscopic way, why not to do it in a minimally invasive way? For cancer, there was a lot of concerns. Basically, people who were advocate of minimal invasive surgery were so enthusiastic, they started doing laparoscopic colon cancer resection, laparoscopic gastrectomies back in 1990s. But, you know, uh, experts in the field, you know, and people who are, I think, somehow, somehow resistant to change in general, raised a lot of concern at that time, which is, you know, mainly in regard to oncologic principles. Sur surgical oncology is different from benign disease. It's about the margin, the lymph node dissection, there were some concerns about pneumoperitoneum spreading tumors uh, cells in, inside the abdomen. Most of the time, you end up with a large specimen that requires a large incision ready for extraction. The long-term oncologic outcomes, it's not benign disease where a patient just goes home and, and that's it. You don't follow it anymore. It's disease-free survival. It's overall survival. And then one thing that raised, you know, back in 1990s about the, what's called the port site metastasis. I've never seen any of this, but... My mentors have told me that was the major concerns of most uh, people at that time, and it was reported to be as high as in 20% in some series. At the same time, there were some issues about the instrumentation and technology, the cost effectiveness and availability. This is uh, a, a, a report in The Lancet back in 1994 uh, after laparoscopic colectomy, where he reported 3 out of 15 patients having port site metastasis this is how it looked like. Uh, uh, this is different from his report. This is, you know, after laparoscopic cholecystectomy. But anyway, this is what we mean by port site metastasis. Uh, you know, some deposits of tumor in, in the, in the, at the site of the entry, at the site of the trocar. And this report had resulted in Steve Waxner. He used to work for the U.S. government. He's now the chief at Cleveland Clinic. He did an editorial review on this subject, and he clearly stated that he was uh, uh, really an authority at that time until valid prospective data on port site recurrence frequency are available. Laparoscopic or thoracoscopic resection of malignancy off protocol should be undertaken with uh, circumspection. So this report, and there were so many talks in the, in the, in the, in the society meetings, and they, you know, the people who really were so enthusiastic about adopting these techniques they become so uh, resistant and stopped using it at all. And I think, this, I think this report kind of made the drawbacks on, I think minimal adversary would be in a better shape if this report was not there at that time. But I think his, his concerns were valid, and the people who really believed in laparoscopic surgery took on themselves to prove that this is wrong. My mentor in my minimally invasive surgery fellowship used to teach me a very important principle of laparoscopy, that we're not inventing a new surgery or procedure. We are providing a different approach of doing it. So if we can do the same surgery with the same steps and provide the same pathologic specimen with better short-term outcomes in terms of, you know, preoperative morbidity and better uh, 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 quality of life, I think we have to do it. So there were so much basic science research in terms of both human and animal providing that laparoscopy compared to open surgery is not bad. Actually, even it's better. There is less inflammatory response. There is better preservation of the immune, immune function system. There is uh, uh, less immune suppression postoperatively laparoscopic compared to open. So this is in terms of basic science research. I can't go through uh, them in details, but it's proven that laparoscopy is associated with less stress response, and better preservation of immune function. In terms of clinical outcomes, 
I think despite at back in 1995, it was so difficult. Still, you know, the, the information technology was, was still way behind compared to what is right now. You know, pioneers have led the way for, with prospective randomized trials to prove that laparoscopy at least is not inferior to open surgery for colon cancer. Four randomized controlled trials for colon cancer, which is the most common GI malignancy, color and classic, and Barcelona trial from Europe. Barcelona was the first ever. Coast trial from, uh, from the United States uh, by Hedy Nielsen from Mayo Clinic. This is a meta-analysis of all these published results. And if you see, this is a forest plot uh, for post-operative complication for all the trials that were published. Most of the time, it favors laparoscopy over, over open surgery. Uh, in terms of what is the most common complications where laparoscopy has better outcome in, uh, compared to open surgery, it's really wound-related complications in terms of wound infection and wound dehiscence, where it is statistically significant compared to open surgery, alias and infective complications in general. In terms of length of hospital stays, persistently this outcome in all the trials that were done that showed you know, favor laparoscopic surgery over open surgeries. In terms of operative time, you know, then this is a persistent finding in almost all the trials that were done for laparoscopy comparing to open, that operative time takes longer. Laparoscopic surgery takes longer compared to open surgery. Uh, and basically, in terms of the long-term oncologic outcomes, this is another meta-analysis of all the trials that were published, showing that disease-free survival and overall survival is the same for colon cancer uh, after laparoscopic colectomy compared to open. So in terms of oncologic outcomes, it is not inferior to open surgery, and we know it has a better short-term outcomes. If you go stage by stage for this meta-analysis, showing most of the studies showed similar outcomes with not, that's not statistically significant even for a uh, stage three colon cancer patient. For rectal cancer, the story was different. Basically, people were reluctant to, you, to do laparoscopic surgery or laparoscopic practectomy. It's because of the, the limited space of the pelvis and the poor instrumentation at that time in terms of staplers and in terms of even for HD cameras. This has pushed the only trial that had looked at some patients with rectal cancer was a classic trial around 200 patients involved with rectal cancer. I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit, but until recently, the guidelines tell that open surgery with meticulous uh, total mesorectal excision is the standard of care uh, for this time. This is the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, and this is the Society of uh, Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons. The, the reason that they were concerned about is that in the classic trial back in the 1990s, uh, late 1990s, there were a trend toward lower lymph nodes uh, uh, in the laparoscopic group for rectal cancer, and a trend however, toward a higher rate of positive circumferential margin. These there were the two concerns. Although they were you know, kind of in favor of open surgery, the three-year reports from classic trial did not show difference in terms of local recurrence and in terms of three-year overall survival. So, and this is what was published in The Lancet back in 2005. This has led the same people who led the COAST trial and the COLOR trial to start studying rectal cancer, uh, uh, laparoscopy for rectal cancer, and they called for two main trials, the COLOR group in Europe, as well as the Hedy Nelson, uh, the Akasog Z6051, uh, that finished uh, 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 recruiting patients and were just waiting for the results to be published soon. But then, as usual, the Europeans have always uh, 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 done a better job in terms of prospective randomized trials compared to the Americans. The COLOR2 trial has just published recently in the Lancet, Oncology Lancet, in August uh, 2013, just two months ago. 1,100 patients, this is the short-term outcomes, were uh, assigned laparoscopic versus open rectal resection. This includes laparoscopic low anterior resection and laparoscopic APR compared to open surgery. They, uh, they found that, again, this is a persistent finding for all prospective randomized trials, that laparoscopy had less blood loss, sooner return of bowel function, shorter hospital stay, and always takes longer. In terms of you know, surrogates of oncologic resection, there were similar positive circumferential margin, around 10%, and similar distal resection margin, and similar lymph node uh, harvest. There were no difference among the, the two groups. So based on this trial that was just published recently, we know now laparoscopy for rectal cancer, at least in the short-term outcomes, and the surrogates for oncologic resections is not inferior to open surgery. They're expecting their long-term outcomes or the, the survival data to be published late this year. The study was carried between 2004 and 2010. 
And so basically, I think uh, we are having the evidence coming for rectal cancer. Uh, it's, it's really limited because of the stabling technique as well as the, 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 uh, the, video, the, camera, the camera that we sometimes we have. It's very difficult to be localized in this limited space. But I think uh, in, uh, minimally laparoscopic surgeons have come all these uh, difficulties and now they can provide the same surgery. Just go back to one of these uh, prospective randomized trials, the one by, done by Lacey from Barcelona. When he published the long-term outcomes back in 2008, there was a 19-month follow-up, he realized there is a trend toward better survival in laparoscopic colectomy group compared to open colectomy group. This was not statistically significant, both the disease-free survival and the overall survival. It's almost reaching statistically right here. But then when he did the subgroup analysis for stage by stage, he found that for stage three patients, for stage three patients, the survival, the disease-free survival, was statistically significant in laparoscopic surgery compared to open surgery. This report back in 2008 had generated so many editorials and discussions on what are the reasons for why laparoscopic colectomy group it had better survival in stage three compared to open colectomy group. Lacey had went and in two printed pages have went in details about the idea or the theory of less immune suppression results in you know, better preservation of the immune function and basically uh, 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 less, uh, 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 better survival, less complication, that means less stress response, better preservation. So he concentrated in the immune suppression issue. And then less tumor manipulation, that means there is less circulating tumor cells, and that means there is better survival. Some people had introduced the introduction of few chemotherapy. We all know stage three patient used uh, benefit from uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy and had better survival with that. But what I strongly believe in, I think it's neither, none of these you know, theories you know, hold valid. Because, you know, it's, again, this is, you're talking about an incident at, at, at some point uh, uh, that would not really uh, uh, affect the overall survival. What I believe myself, and what I, I think when I, I read his editorial, it's not really the, the immune suppression. I, I believe it's the early administration of adjuvant chemotherapy and better overall tolerance. Laparoscopic patients had, had less complications. I think they were you know, having a, a, a earlier administration of chemotherapy and, and overall they tolerated the, the chemotherapy well by better preservation of their overall system. Now, because we all know this is a multidisciplinary management, and I believe that adjuvant chemotherapy was helped here. Now, my, my theory was really not valid. I was trying to prove it on multiple uh, attempts to do some research. I contacted the PIs on all these randomized controlled trials, trying to see if the time of initiation of chemotherapy was recorded in any of their trials, but none of them looked at this indicator as the time of initiation of chemotherapy. And I think it's a very important quality indicator for the cancer patient. Until recently, this again, two years ago, it's still published online. There's no printed page of it. Uh, the group from WashU have published maybe the first evidence in GI cancer where minimal invasive surgery results in early administration of chemotherapy. Basically, the mean time of postoperative chemotherapy initiation was 50 days for the laparoscopic group compared to 75 days for the open group. And the, the, the approach of surgery was an under, independent predictor for the initiation of chemotherapy. So pioneers or people who really do laparoscopic surgery for cancer, now they start looking into this indicator as, 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 as something that we have to prove you know, uh, for, for open surgery that the time of initiation of chemotherapy is earlier and the patient do better uh, for overall. This is another presentation from HPPA uh, this year. Uh, this is just an oral presentation for minimally invasive uh, resection of colorectal liver metastasis also resulted in an earlier administration of chemotherapy compared to their open counterpart. Another indicator that we don't really pay attention a lot to it is the quality of life of this patient. This is the COST trial long-term follow-up showing that the quality of life for this patient is much better. This is an 18-month follow-up, favors laparoscopy, and their overall uh, acceptance of their outlooks was fav favoring laparoscopy compared to open. What we have done at King, King Hussein Cancer Center, I can tell you minimal invasive surgery for colorectal cancer has been around for a while. Dr. Mahmoud al-Masri had led the, uh, the, the, our experience here, but my own experience for over the last year, I've done totally of six cases, laparoscopic colorectal resection, uh, two low anterior resections, one converted to open because of the locally advanced disease, one anterior resection, two uh, hemicolectomies, and one 
total abdominal colectomy. And this is a video of uh, 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 in a female patient with a, a, a rectosigmoid tumor. Basically, uh, this is the uterus. We stuck it to the abdominal wall. This is the right ureter right here. This is the right iliac vessels uh, uh, where you have to identify. We're taking the mesentery here, at least uh, going uh, as, as low as we can uh, uh, <coughs> with the, uh, to take the vessel, to do high ligation of the vessels. Again, this is the right iliac vessel, and this is the right ureter. Then we... Uh, <coughs> And this is the, the left side, this is the left ureter, this is the left iliac vessels, and this is the mesentery of the colon. Uh, the, here we're opening the, <coughs> the peritoneum anterior to the rectum. And after that, we're trying to skeletonize the rectum to the, the level that we, this is the rectum here, skeletonized. And here we're introducing the stapler uh, to staple the rectum. Sorry for my poor video editing uh, skills, but uh, I did my best uh, for that. This is the left ureter again. This is the rectal stump. After we finish the transection of the rectum, uh, we uh, uh, do take the mesentery, and then we exteriorize the specimen through a small incision, and uh, basically we finish the transection outside, and then we drop uh, the, uh, the, the specimen, uh, or at least the colon where we have to uh, hook it to the rectum back into the abdomen. This is, I mark here the, the site where I think the colon can reach uh, easily to the rectum without any tension. This happened after mobilizing the whole splenic flexure. And uh, basically, uh, <coughs> this is the anvil uh, uh, part. And this is the uh, EA stapler coming uh, from the rectum into the patient pelvis, from the patient pelvis. This is the male uh, end of the, of the, an of the EA stapler. And then basically we uh, uh, hook it together right there. This is laparoscopic anvil holder. It's very important to have it for this part. And this is where we were doing the anastomosis using a circular stapler. And then after that, once you're done, you, you test your stapler under under anastomosis underwater and make sure there is no air leak. So basically, this is what the patient ends up in terms of incisions, small, uh, around five to six centimeter incisions, and three smaller incisions. Most of patients have gone home within four to five days after surgery. Most of the lymph nodes were, uh, 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 there were no uh, under, under, under staging with lymph nodes. So this is in terms of uh, uh, minimally invasive management of colorectal cancer. The next subject, I'm going to talk about the minimally invasive management of gastric cancer. When we talk about gastrectomies for gastric cancer, we have to talk about the type of lymph node dissections. Typically, there is two types of lymph node dissections. There is D1, what we call D1, where we do the perigastric lymph node dissection. And then this has been uh, available. This is what most of the West believe in as the, the ideal treatment for uh, gastric cancer. But then the Japanese and general Asians, Chinese and Koreans, they believe in what we call D2 lymph node dissection, where you have to clear all the lymph nodes across the major vessels, hepatic, artery, splenic, celiac, as well as left gastric. There were a lot of you know, talk in the literature in the past I, 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 you know, about what is the best uh, uh, type of lymph node dissection. This is the two, West, West, you know, it's the standard of care in Asian is to do D2 lymph node dissection. For Europeans, they did two trials uh, that are very famous, the Dutch as well as the British trial, and they compared D1 compared to D2 uh, restriction, and they found that D2 is associated with worse uh, outcomes in terms of postoperative morbidity as well as mortality compared to D1. This had resulted in most Western uh, 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 surgeons to believe that D1 is really the, the, the surgery rather than D2. I'm not going to go into details of these trials, but... You know, in their long-term follow-up of the Dutch trial, 11-year follow-up, what they found that there are no benefits of D2 for N0 or N1 patients, but D2 really uh, benefits patients with N2 disease. They have a trend toward better survival. So you have to tailor, according to their study, tailor your uh, lymph node dissection to the stage of the patients, whether it's a locally advanced or not. But at King Hussein Cancer Center, we, we strongly believe that D2 is, is, the, is the surgery that we has to be performed 
for uh, uh, gastric cancer, and this is what we've been doing uh, 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 for many years. The question is, can we do it laparoscopically? The first laparoscopic gastrectomy uh, was done in, by a Japanese surgeon called Katano back in 1991. And it's been proven now that you can safely perform D2 dissection and clear all the vessels without uh, uh, any increase in postoperative morbidity and mortality. Uh, this is a Chinese trial showing laparoscopic versus open gastrectomy in terms of D1 uh, if, of both the word and D2. The number of lymph node harvest was similar and there was no difference in, uh, in, in the number of lymph nodes. There were so many trials. They were mainly based in, in, in Asia, Japan, Korea, and China, some in, in Europe in terms of uh, laparoscopic versus open gastrectomy uh, for gastric cancer. This is a meta-analysis for 25 trials, six randomized and, and 19 non-randomized, but they were high quality. This is showing that the post-operative over overall complication favors laparoscopic uh, gastrectomy compared to open gastrectomy. This is in terms of blood loss, also favor laparoscopic gastrectomy compared to open gastrectomy. In terms of mortality, it's, it's the same. And in terms of uh, uh, hospital stay, always favor laparoscopic gastrectomy compared to open gastrectomy. And again, it's, it's always a, a laparoscopic gastrectomy took longer compared to open gastrectomy. But this is a very interesting, this, this meta-analysis was done by the Sloan Kettering group. They found that the number of lymph node harvested was uh, in favor of open gastrectomy rather than laparoscopic gastrectomy. But in all the trials, the proportion of patients uh, with less than 15 lymph nodes, we know we need at least 15 lymph nodes to adequately stage gastric cancer. The proportion of patients with less than 15 lymph nodes was similar. So none of the say, patients were under stage even with laparoscopy. In terms of long-term oncologic outcomes, same result. This is a meta-analysis for patients with advanced gastric cancer. Laparoscopic gastrectomy versus open gastrectomy had similar overall survival as well as similar uh, disease-free survival. So, you know, it's, it's again and again proven that the laparoscopic approach results in a better quality of life, better at least post-operative complication profile compared to open gastrectomy with similar oncologic outcomes. What I've performed, uh, what we've done at KHCC, we have performed the first laparoscopic gastrectomy in July of this year. Uh, I've uh, done a uh, total of three cases out of seven gastrectomies. Uh, total gastrectomy two cases that were performed laparoscopically and one distal gastrectomy uh, uh, with, uh, that we have to convert to open because it's locally advanced. And this is a video of uh, 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 the first laparoscopic gastrectomy that we performed. Basically, this is what we're trying to here is mobilize, uh, cocorizing the duodenum. You see here the inferior vena cava right there. <coughs> this is the inferior vena cava just underneath the duodenum right here. After that, we start our portal uh, 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 dissection. This is the common hepatic artery that we're trying to clear all lymphatics across the common. This is the portal vein right here. We are encircle uh, the artery just to help us with uh, retraction. <coughs> this is the common hepatic artery. We're following it up until we reach the celiac trunk right there. And after we reach the celiac trunk and take all the lymph nodes around it, we, this is the left gastric artery that we clip. <coughs> so we're trying to do uh, as much as we can in terms of clearing all the lymph nodes across the major vessel. This is the splenic artery, left gastric, common, hepatic, and the celiac right here. And uh, the portal vein was underneath uh, the, uh, the common hepatic artery. This is here where uh, I identified the duodenum. Uh, around like, you know, two to three centimeters of the duodenum is taken. This is the head of pancreas right here. We, I, I really make sure that the gastroduodenal artery is, is, uh, is intact here because it's what's the pancreas and uh, the duodenum. This is the gastroduodenal artery would rely on uh, after uh, the transection. And then basically we uh, take the momentum of the colon right here. This takes a long time, especially in obese patients. <coughs> And then <clears throat> you enter the lesser sac <coughs> and finish up taking the short gastric vessels. Sorry. Come on. Lavish complication CD. <laughs> I think we need a better computer. That's what we need. <laughs> I'm going to prove you wrong. Yeah. 
ما صار بليدنج سيزن انت ما كنتش موجود اني واي سوري بس هاف تو ما بقدرش اقدم هون فور سم ريزن بس after you clear all the vessels uh, you know you in transecting the duodenum and <coughs> transecting the, uh, the the esophagus basically you do the reconstruction and it's always done uh, laparoscopically and uh, <coughs> this is this is the portal vein right here this is again the celiac trunk and this is the left gastric vessel right here. Again, sorry for my poor editing uh, 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 of the videos, but uh, this is the splenic artery. It started right there, celiac, common hepatic, left gastric. This is where we're transecting the duodenum. So basically, we can perform, uh, you know, a extensive lymph node dissection compared uh, doing laparoscopically safely with with good uh, short-term outcome. <coughs> See, there's no bleeding right here. Who, who said there's bleeding? We have. There's no bleeding. Okay, and this is that specimen that we extract after that. You know, the whole omentum, all the lymph nodes right here, and uh, uh, <coughs> this is about minimal invasive gastrectomies. And then finally, about uh, minimal invasive management of hepatic malignancy. Uh, you know, liver resection has always uh, you know, talked about bleeding, and it's very difficult to do. But it's first reported back in 1993. The French had led the way in terms of laparoscopic liver resection. Shurik, at, uh, uh, back in 2000, had presented 30 cases. And since then, they are the most expert in this regard. If you look at what is the evidence of laparoscopic liver resection compared to open liver resection, this is one of the best available uh, uh, resource is the world experience, about 2,800 patients uh, from the University of Pittsburgh group. Uh, they did collect all the information. If you notice that the laparoscopic liver resection had increased significantly over the last uh, almost uh, 15 years, uh, and for benign or malignant indications, mainly initially it was mainly for benign indications, now mostly used for malignant indications. 52% of all these patients were for HCC and 35% for colorectal liver metastasis. You know, in terms of outcomes, most short-term out, short outcomes were even better for laparoscopic versus open, and the same thing for survival. And this is a study uh, 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 from 2012 showing that, you know, this is an interesting finding where the duration of surgery was shorter for the laparoscopic surgery rather than the open surgery, but in terms of blood loss, complication, and length of stay, favoring laparoscopic. Long-term oncologic outcomes for colorectal liver metastasis, the same, similar for HCC. Again, a similar long-term oncologic outcomes. So persistently and over and over, we have evidence that laparoscopy for cancer results in better short-term outcomes and similar long-term oncologic outcomes. We had performed the first laparoscopic liver resection at KHC, and I believe in Jordan, too. Uh, we had a total of seven cases performed laparoscopically out, out of 25 liver resection that I performed last year. Uh, this left lateral segmentectomy, two cases. One, we had to convert to open because I found new lesions uh, incidentally, and I had to do a very careful intraoperative ultrasound. We don't have the laparoscopic probe for the ultrasound. Hopefully, we'll have it one day. Right posterior sector segment six and seven, one case. Hand-assisted right lobectomy, uh, one case, and major wedge resection other than uh, uh, biopsies were three cases. And this is uh, a hand-assisted laparoscopic uh, right uh, hepatectomy that I performed on a 34-year-old male patient with colorectal liver metastasis. We tried to use the hockey stick ultrasound that we have to do the intraoperative ultrasound. It was suboptimal, but we managed to rule out metastasis elsewhere. Here we're just mobilizing uh, the liver from all aspects, from above and from the diaphragm. This is my hand right here. This is the transverse colon, and this is the underneath of the liver. So you do the full mobilizations before you start any vascular uh, 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 dissections. Uh, this is the inferior vena cava right here. 
Again, this is the inferior vena cava. This is the pair area of the liver. Again, complete mobilization of the liver of the diaphragm. This is one of the short hepatic veins that I think this is a big advantage for laparoscopy where you can really easily see it and even you know, take care of it before you can avulse it the, during open surgery. Sometimes these small branches, uh, you cannot see it very well. <coughs> so after you, uh, you clip it, you cut it. Another uh, a branch, very small one, again right there, short hepatic between the kiriva and the, the right lobe of the liver. <coughs> so this is part of the full mobilization until you reach the right hepatic vein. Uh, where it's the major uh, uh, venous branch that's draining. This is the right hepatic vein right there, and this is the inferior vena cava. Then you start your portal vein dissection, and this is, again, very uh, dangerous, and you have to be very careful doing it. And uh, this is some of the lymphatic. This is the right portal vein, but you have to clear it very well and see the left portal vein when you do a right lobectomy. A small branch from the right portal vein to the caudate lobe that you have to take care of, otherwise it will bleed uh, uh, significantly, bleeding from the portal vein is very significant. This is here where we're trying to clear, the, uh, isolate the right portal vein. This is the main portal vein and this is the left portal vein. You'll see it uh, better in, in just one second. So carefully, back and forth, back and forth, taking your time here is very, very essential. And uh, it uh, has a lot of blood going through the portal vein as we all know. So there is another small branch, you know, from the portal vein bifurcation to the portal triad that you have also to take care of, otherwise it will bleed. So I think this is an advantage for laparoscopy where you can see better. This is the left portal vein right here. This is the right hepatic artery that you identify, clip. Sorry for, again, the poor quality of the video. So this is the left, right hepatic artery. And then this is, again, the left portal vein, right portal vein. You have to really make sure you see the left portal vein when you're transecting the right portal vein. And uh, this is where we use the endo-GIA stapler, vascular load. And this is one of the most important steps to do it uh, during laparoscopic resection. This is the, I uh, put some clips uh, uh, to add it on. And then you, 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 after taking the end flow, you take the out flow which is the right hepatic vein right here. Some people now start, the, now at this stage, start parenchymal transection and leave this step to the, to the end, but I, I, I elected to do it to completely isolate the right lobe uh, from any uh, potential bleeding during parenchymal transection. This is where you take the, and this is the inferior vena cava, and this is the stable line. And then you start your parenchymal transection and uh, using alternating between electrocautery, a harmonic scalpel, uh, which is an uh, ultrason ultrasonic uh, uh, dissector, and also the Aquamantis machine, which is a saline cooled uh, radio, radio frequency coagulator, and also major vessels inside the parenchyma, you take it with uh, endo-GIA staplers, uh, vascular load. Again, this is where you uh, do the parenchymal transition between, at the, at the line of demarcation between uh, the right and left lobe. This is the uh, Aquamantis machine. It's using uh, uh, radio frequency coagulation with some saline uh, to cool it off and spread the heat. Major uh, vessels inside the liver, you take it with uh, endovascular stapler. Some people use clip applier here. I prefer uh, endo uh, GIA staplers. This is the inferior vena cava underneath you right there. <coughs> So you keep, uh, you know, alternating between these two instru uh, instruments until you have complete parenchymal uh, transection at the end. <coughs> and uh, basically this is the inferior vena cava from inside where it's completely cleared up. This is the right hepatic vein stable line. This is the uh, short hepatic veins. And it's kind of uh, scary to see the cava this way, but, uh, and this is the transection surface. Uh, this is the incision of the patient around uh, uh, seven to eight centimeter compared to either a major subcostal incision or, uh, or midline laparotomy. He did very well and went home on uh, day five. <coughs> so minimal invasive uh, management at KHC, I think we have done uh, very well over the last many years. I know uh, our colleagues in OBGYN uh, have, uh, do, do most of their uh, uh, hysterectomies and salpingoophorectomies in a laparoscopic way. Same as uh, our thoracic surgeon and uh, neurosurgeons as well as our uh, 
orthopedic surgeons. I think uh, this, 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 this achievement, what we've done so far, it's really because of the support, tremendous support from all of you, all uh, starting from our leadership uh, to the nurses in the OR. I think we have to stick to the principle that we're not providing a different, sir, uh, we're not doing a different procedure, we're just providing a different approach of doing it. And I think why it's not, you know, utilized more, I think it, we're really resistant to change in general, but I think, you know, uh, with your support, we can, we can overcome this issue. And one thing is, is that the, the minimal invasive cancer management, if you, th if you look at it, it, it's at actually two disciplines of, of surgery. It's the minimally invasive way and the cancer management of way. These two disciplines have different training paths, but what I've done myself is combining both to achieve what I've achieved so far. And I think we're definitely still going through our learning curve uh, as a whole team, starting from the OR nurses, anesthesia, myself, uh, residents, and, and, and fellows. And, but basically, eventually, we, we will get over it, and hopefully everything will be as perfect uh, as we can. And uh, again, together we achieve more. I would like to thank all the team members that are uh, working with us, Dr. Ihab Massad, Baha, uh, and uh, the nursing staff from the OR. We really, without your support, we would not reach where we have reached so far. Thank you very much. Osama, <clears throat> such a surgery, this uh, liver resection, just a question. How long it took you for in the, this patient for, to, to, for so, such uh, a surgery? The first cases took more than six no, hours. Last, last case, for example. The liver section took more, took more than six hours. But you, you think su such cases, it took long, it takes long time usually. What about the cases with comorbidities, those who are with COPD, ischemic heart disease, heart failure? Do you take such cases for uh, laparoscopic surgery or you, you avoid those cases, you know, since you are they are exposed to long time of anesthesia and it might affect their, their lives, you know. So, you know, generally you have to be very selective, no questions about it in terms of who, who, what's the, who, the, who are the patients that takes to, uh, to, lap, to do laparoscopic surgery. Part of it, the weight, the BMI, the location of the tumor. So you have to be very selective. Now, in terms of, of patients with comorbidities, I believe laparoscopy is better for them than open surgery. Because I think the, the major stress for anesthesia is the time of induction. It's not the duration of surgery. And this has been proven many times that laparoscopy overall is better. Now, these are my first cases. Definitely, I would not take patients with so much comorbidities to, to, to do laparoscopic surgery. But I think once we are over our learning curve, I would, I would not hesitate to do it if it takes, you know, again, I'm sure our time would get better with, with time. But I think it's that induction of anesthesia what stress the patient mainly and not, not the duration of anesthesia. This is number one. Number two, COBD patients definitely do better with laparoscopy than uh, open surgery. Thank you. Um, part of it, Osama, I, I think we, we should also uh, uh, like stress on the point that W the more we do, the better we, we are. Not as a surgeon, uh, not as the surgeon is the sole uh, problem with this. I think the whole setup, the OR, uh, the OR setup, which is still suboptimal, the instruments, and the, uh, the other team uh, should, uh, uh, w with time, uh, will get better, and the time will go shorter. And this is, has been proven. Uh, the more you do, uh, the, the it's not the surgeon alone, but the, the whole setup is better, and then the the time is shorter, uh, and the outcome is better. I totally agree with you. And basically, if you look at most of these, uh, you know, authorities in laparoscopic surgery, they have the same anesthesia, the same OR assistant, the same fellow, the same nurse. So all the time, and that's where you get, as you said, you get a team, and you get these good results and good outcomes in terms of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. For us, definitely, but I didn't want to touch on this point uh, at this time. Professor. Thank you, Osama. It's my feeling that uh, we in the Department of Surgery, as well as the KSSC, we are very proud to have you among us. Thank you. Two issues. One, you did not touch on the cost. It seems it's, it, it keep it hidden. That's one issue is comparing laparoscopy versus open. The other issue is when you look to the hospital stay, 
as well as the quality of life. The problem with these studies, they are not, they are randomized, but they are not blinded. I mean, I mean by that, that the surgeon know that this patient has a, an open surgery, and that patient has a laparoscopic surgery, and most of the time they are pushing for the laparoscopic surgery to go home early. And I remember one of these studies was never published under the effect of the manufacturer companies for the instrument. At the time of the laparoscopic cholecystectomy in Leeds, they randomized patients to open versus uh, mini, mini lab, uh, open mini cholecystectomy versus uh, lab uh, cholecystectomy. And all the patients, they have the same dressing. And nobody knows that that patient had lab or mini cholecystectomy. And the result was negative. All patients, they went home early, they had the same quality of life, and they have no whatsoever wound complications. So probably there is, there is a push of, a push of more um, to have a favorable result for the laparoscopic surgery because they are not blinded. That's, that's one. Um, and you know that the difference in hospital stay is 24 hour in most of the cases. It's only one day, probably one and a half day. And this can be overcome when you have a setup, um, what we call the fast track for colon surgery. That this, this is one, uh, one, one issue. The other issue is delaying chemotherapy in that study. I wonder why. Because my knowledge in wound healing, the, 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 the difference in laparoscopy versus open is the wound. The procedure inside is similar. So I, the, 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 what I know from the biology of wound healing, that the wound, they are healed from side to side, not from end to end. So I wonder why the delay in initiating chemotherapy in the open group of, co of colon surgery. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, and uh, again, <coughs> what we have done here also, you were very supportive for us uh, and pushing us to do it. Uh, the first, in terms of the cost, I uh, totally agree with you that, you know, some studies have shown a higher cost for laparoscopy in terms of the OR cost itself. So OR cost is higher, but the hospital stay had compensated for that in most of the studies. So the overall cost was almost similar in almost all the trials. Uh, or the studies that looked into the cost. And, uh, you know, when you, when you save the patient a one or two days in, in the United States, a day in the hospital, almost $1,000 compared to the instruments that we use. So the cost issue, I think, you know, it's a valid at some points if you, if you use the too much uh, of staplers, but you compensate that with the ICU stay as well as the total hospital stay. In terms of uh, the hospital stay, uh, you know, and uh, I think... Uh, one or two days, maybe here we don't care about it. Uh, I know we just got an email this morning that we're having a backup of patient in the ER. So I think if you can get the patient home a day or two earlier, it, although it does not cost us a lot, but the whole system would benefit from, from an early discharge even a day earlier. And regarding <clears throat> your last uh, 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 questions about the wound healing, actually if you look, there's a SEER, uh, uh, SEER database review about timing of initiation of chemotherapy after, after surgery in general, where they looked at there's a lot of patients delayed more than eight weeks uh, of, of initiating chemotherapy. They, 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 they claimed or they found that the main reason is complications, wound-related complications, wound infection, wound dehiscence. Uh, that's what really delayed most of the chemotherapy. In their literature, in their studies, these are the two, two new studies. Again, this is something new that people had started looking at it recently. Uh, where, you know, they found that, you know, they're trying to prove laparoscopic surgeon that really you get to chemotherapy earlier. I, I believe if you have less complications, you get to, to chemotherapy earlier than if you had a complication. That's what I, I believe, but uh, there's no evidence to support my, my belief right now. Last question. <laughs> my question is about the perception and the acceptance of the patient offering them uh, minimally invasive surgery in oncology. This is the question we've been uh, asked a lot. Uh, are you sure we want uh, a clearer or more dissection? So do you find resistance in the patients when you offer them uh, uh, minimally invasive surgery or laparoscopic surgery, or do they accept? Because they, they've been asking us this question 